This is uh, not really a full presentation or anything. It's just kind of a just very small thing, uh, more of an intervention, I guess. Anders asked me just to kind of say a few words. But anyway, uh, well, we did the introduction before. So, Daniel Peterson, uh, if you guys want to tweet or contact me or anything, um, that's the tweet handle, and uh, I'll have an email address later on. But anyway, um, the last year, I've been actually spending quite a lot of time on sort of the subject of the Internet of Things. And uh, in sort of various projects, it's been health projects, it's been sort of smaller, kind of just more kind of prototypes and more experimental kind of stuff. But then also I had uh, the luxury of having quite a lot of time. So I did um, go to the school in, uh, the design school in, uh, in Helsinki, because that's where I'm living right now, and uh, managed to sell kind of the whole idea of kind of Internet of Things to one of the professors there and said okay let's run a course in this you know like it's more it's not kind of a, it's it's a design driven uh, internet of things course where we more or less explore different topics and it was a complete experiment in the spring where I invited uh, sort of speakers uh, that uh, that I thought kind of was important it was fairly close to me in uh, you know kind of either in Helsinki or just kind of in the vicinity and we started looking at sort of trends and things. I'll, I'll run through extremely quickly, you know, of some of the topics. And then in the fall here, we actually did a proper course. So it's not an experiment anymore. It's actually a real course. You got credit in the beginning too, but now you get, now you definitely get credits if you're in Alta University. And I also, there was a proper budget, etc. So I could actually start inviting people from abroad, from like the whole kind of, say, North European region, um, and kind of looking at different topics. And... Um, this kind of has uh, spawned kind of tons of different discussions in this topic, and it's and it's just turning out to be a truly remarkable, um, kind of super exciting topic actually. And kind of on that story too, um, I have a much longer talk I can do about there. It actually turns out in uh, 13 years ago we had a startup in this space, but it was called telematics back then, and you couldn't really order anything from the internet. You had to build every little thing yourself, the server. The system, the connection to the satellite, so you know, to track things, the tracker, you had to build the chips even to have in the tracker, and kind of the whole, the only thing you could buy was the GSM modem or the satellite kind of modem because there was someone supplying that. So you had to build every bit of the chain of these systems. Today you go and buy Arduinos, there's telephones, there's chips, there's trackers, etc. You just order them and assemble it yourself. You know, you don't have to be a computer scientist or even a designer, or you know, you can be anyone to, you know, who can read a manual who can do that. So it's it's a kind of innovation in this space. Is, I think is you know it's quite exciting right now. Anyway, so here's just some few things you know super quick we did. We talked about trends. You all, I I would assume I kind of look upon you as experts in this area now. So I'm not gonna kind of explain anything. But here, so trends uh, you know it's super cheap, super small, I and mean, we actually have it everywhere. We looked at uh, the sort of smart cities, and, we, and the thing that kind of came out of that was the time. The time it takes to dig streets up and put cables and things in there. And so it can take several years to connect the little screen. So we're running around Stockholm today, and now you have, on a lot of places, you have these actually, you know, these big, bill, well, used to be big billboards, now they're a little bit smaller, but they're kind of TVs. They're not really interactive in the sense you can't really do anything with them yet, I guess, but they at least show you moving things. You know, from a few years ago, that's quite substantial. Infra um, infrastructure then, lots and lots and lots of data. Uh, IBM is currently inventing this uh, stream computing, they call it. It's kind of like dipping a probe or actually fishing in a river where, where all the data come through and then you can pick out the pieces you're interested in. You discard everything else because there's just no space to save it. Wearables was another thing. We talked about fashionable, you know, because uh, headphones, everyone here has headphones and you might have like really funky ones or expensive ones or you might and you probably don't have the really cheap ones that comes with your phone or something like that. So you actually you kind of trade up, you build, you buy these things. There was even, whatever her name is, the former president of France, she was actually in a billboard with a pair of headphones just very recently. Gaming, also, from kind of this kind of thing to actually gaming with real things. And it's not, I'm not talking about kind of the 3D leap and all these kind of connect things. I'm actually talking about physical little objects. And the Skylander might ring a bell if you've seen that. It's just a, a kind of a really amazing and kind of inna innovative concept. So that was kind of the quick bit. We did was ex very experimental and kind of talks and about this. And then we dove in kind of last, and we actually this one we had just a few days ago, kind of 
we invi I invited an expert who came out of out from Berlin and talked about energy. And the thing that came out of there is like people don't care. Many of the things that we actually talk about in this space, people don't care. Whether it's uh, infrastructure such as water or electricity or networks, etc., we just expect them to be there and work, and we don't really pay attention to them. Product design, path of least, least resistance. And many of these things they do uh, what I talk about as the disappearance act. So if you take an iPhone, Spotify, and let's say a Sonos wireless speaker, that just that little chain of things, which you just go and buy in a shop and kind of order, is replacing your huge stack of vinyls and your stereo system, which used to be a social object before. It doesn't exist anymore because you don't share phones. But anyway, materials. We um. Sorry, really <laughs> quick. Uh, I only have 10 minutes for this, and that's why I'm going fast. Materials, uh, we talked about sort of communication or networks as materials. We don't really have, we can't articulate, we can't describe. Even as designers, we have huge difficulty of describing whatever goes through the air in this case. How, you know, what is network? What does it actually mean? What does a Wi Fi signal look like? What's GPS? What do you need to do? What do you do with GPS even sometimes? Uh, presence. It's another one. It's a little bit towards infrastructure again. We have a big problem with um, understanding kind of this concept because we can't see it. So it's like the example I'm going to give there is this guy who talked about this, Lorenzo. He he he's into in, uh, transportation. So it's like, why do we have this? You know, things doesn't get to where it is. Where does it go? So we put a tracker in a box and put it in the mail system. We also put a camera in another one and kind of send it around the mail system. There's actually a little video on that online you can have a look at. But the tracker, well, you know, when he could see this package moving through this whole kind of system, and he was going to send it from Umeå to our address, just five kilometers from there, the whole package went down to Stockholm, I think to somewhere else in Sweden, and then on the way back, and then it got lost in this particular case. But it's kind of interesting, because the map, he just kind of takes the data, visualizes it on a Google, and you, then you ask, it's like, why did it travel these, what is it, 2,500 kilometers? to go five. Don't really know. And then the last thing we did the other day was in, we, we had a guy called Jamie Allen who's head of research at Com Copenhagen Institute of Interaction Design and he talked about infrastructure in his ways and kind of a digital artist. But he's actually an engineer in the beginning so he has a pretty uh, well pretty good understanding of how these things work. So we focused on infrastructure and he had this idea of, you know, we, we shouldn't talk about what is infrastructure, we should talk about when is infrastructure. Because use it as a verb, when does it happen? Because infrastructure doesn't always work. Train breaks down here, traffic doesn't work, it's stuck. If you go to Mexico City, you're going to be out of power every few hours. So people charge up their phones and laptops and then they have three hours of blackout and then it comes back again. So when is infrastructure? That was it for that. Now to the thing I wanted to try here, and this is kind of like a thesis, or a, uh, it's kind of it's an experiment. You tell me if I'm wrong, but it's the one little bit in the end there where I'm going to figure, uh, what I'm going to actually focus a lot of attention on this spring. So anyway, so what does sort of the market of that Internet of Things or network products I wrote here today look like? I think you all know pretty much. You know, you have a very explorative space, kind of down here. This is the cheap end of things, you know, low cost and things, explorative. Good night lamp. Has anyone seen it? Yep. You have a few lamps, you turn one on, the other one turns off. On, I think. So very explorative, very cute in a sense. Beautiful project, but very low volume in a sense. And I don't know what kind of impact it's going to make. I think it's a beautiful illustration of what you can do. Then you have what I call, I talk about them as precursors right now, because I think they're really, it's really early. You have all the Fitbits, the Nike Fuel Band, the, the Sonos, whatever, Spotify playing system, etc., etc. You've seen them all. Little printers. Little printer, anyone? I saw one here, right there. You use it. Sort of. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we are, uh, the other one, we are just looking at the fridge. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful little product in a sense, and it's kind of fun for a while, and then you start wondering what you're going to use it for. Then we have, uh, we jump to this end. Then we have the industrial world. So anyway, it's kind of like, it's pretty cheap in this end, you know, not that much money. Come to the industrial end, and then, you know, you have the Cisco's, the IBM's, the Qualcomm, etc. Cisco say, we're going to have 50 trillion things, and we're going to use IP version 6 to address every bit or atom in on this planet. You know, it's got all these crazy comments. 
But these things are happening. We're building, say, take Rio, for instance. They're going to have the Olympics in 2016. They built, um, you know, this huge control center. It looks like us when they shoot up their rockets to the moon. You know, like these old NASA-style station. And they have it. It's I don't know where it is in the city. It's outside the city or in the city. And then they, you know, uh, they put down cables, uh, cameras, etc., to control every little part of the town so it's safe for Olympics. So that's at least sort of the kind of the course they were using it for. And that's, I guess, the reason why IBM managed to sell it for billions of dollars. But that's not the only place. You know, it's happening in London. It's happening here, for some respect. We don't really talk about it. But it's what we're doing. It. So they're digging in, you know, cables, sensors, all kinds of weird systems. We have no idea what they are. Huge money. And uh, big data, etc. And then we have this big space in the middle, which is, I think, is kind of, you know, somewhere in the middle. And it, it's just pretty much empty, you know, it's kind of, I don't know where it tops out here, maybe a few thousand dollars, and then, and this starts at like a hundred million dollars, you know, it's like nothing. What is then, you know, here? And that's kind of thing. I think, um, you know, this is where, you know, they say, I don't know if you know about athletic machines, this guy in Zurich who's doing the quadcopters who can sort of balance and little things. So that's the type of things that goes in here. And I have just that small kind of... Uh, I don't know if you've seen this. Use this as a precursor. This is kind of an illustration, I guess. So this is lit, or C1, actually, concept one. And it's a two-wheel car. You know, it's nothing fantastic with that. So it's two wheels, you know, driving wheel, uh, or no, steering wheel, and, you know, the standard things to drive. It's uh, essentially like, you know, if one person is supposed to sit behind you, and you can sit here, or you can have your stuff in the back, and then you drive it off, like just like a normal car. And the interesting thing with that is that it's what? Well, it's electric and yeah. So I'll show you a short just twenty second clip here. If it sort of so you get the the idea with it. It's sort of it's just taken straight from their website, etc. I have absolutely no affiliation with them, etc. But I'll come to the point mm. why I wanna show this. Two-wheel car, you know, nothing fancy. But the interesting thing with this is that it's a product, as a service. Actually, this one has an app, so you can actually control it. But it has, and it has gyros. It's built on some a technology called gyros, or gyroscopes. Been around forever. I think World War One, uh, the kind of the old Russian um, navy, they had these huge binoculars which you watch kind of submarines with, and you kind of turn them on, and then they go. Well, and you can, the horizontal went just completely straight, even if you were shaking around, because of gyros. So it's like a mechanical thing. Then, if we jump to some uh, some really, oh, this is actually a movie from 1963, so it's going to be really bad, and you know it's really low res quality. This is, you know, it's a proper real driving experiment. So, but what do you see? You know, it's the same thing, but you know, obviously it doesn't have an electric engine. It, um, you know, runs on gas. It's actually, that particular one is called Gyro X, I think, and it was all built in aluminium, and it was supposed to go really fast, and they built one. It still exists, but now it has three wheels. <laughs> but, <laughs> because it didn't really work. <laughs> but anyway, so I mean, idea is great. You know, idea already 40 years ago. But what's the difference between this and the other one? I mean, that's the, that's the important thing in this bit, and that's the thing, I think you know, it's going to help fill out this big space. That graph I showed you is probably not rightly sized and things. It's more like a mental kind of illustration. Nevertheless, it's... Let's jump to the next one. It's this. So we know a lot about products. You know, we can do more or less build any type of product. Product We just have to come up with in a sense. And I mean in the physical sense. You can call it object. And then we have the service. We know quite a lot about, you know, there's plenty of people here who can do, who know tons of stuff about sort of any type of digital service, etc. So we know quite a lot about that as well. We know how to construct that. And then we come to this space. And this is the, this is the key. It's the algorithm, the kind of the, 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 let's call it intelligent software that runs on these things. And this is the difference between the built car, this two-wheel car built today, and the two-wheel car built in 1963. Because in 63, you could not build a computer. If you could potentially build someone something that looked like a computer of today, it's going to be huge and it's going to be super slow, and you can definitely not put it on that car. But today, 
these things are tiny and you can just put masses of them inside this car. And the algorithm is the one that makes it, you know, you, makes you be able to control the car so it never more or less tips over. When you park it, you just leave it. When you reverse, if you want to have it skidding in the corners, that's a programmable feature, not of how good you are as a driver. This is the key thing. This is the key thing that's going to be for quadcopters or whatever you want to use them for. Let's take the Amazon example in the later, the earlier this week, where they're going to send, you know, little drones to deliver your stuff. It's, you know, it's a media stunt, but nevertheless, it's going to be the software and the smartness of those things they're going to, if we ever going to make that happen. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to test on you and see if you actually agree with me on. But anyway, I'm going to be spending a lot of time on that in, in the spring, so maybe we can talk more about it then. So thanks. <laughs> and if you have any ideas, etc., you know, just put it on Twitter or email. So, thanks. Should we... Yeah, sure. Do you want to... Any immediate yeah. comments or questions? I don't know how much time I used to have. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Great talk. Yes? As a very old computer scientist, I agree with you with the algorithms, but the interesting part is not the algorithm, it's the combination of algorithm and service. Yeah. Because the algorithm actually enables you to give great service, yeah. or, uh, great music type of services. Yeah. I agree with you because I, for 15 years I've been quite bored with the web because it was like uh, two or three steps back when it comes to computer science. Mm. All the interesting stuff that I learned in school was like just waste. Mm. Uh, and Google was actually one of the interesting things that came up because they actually had an algorithm that was you know, interesting in an internet sense you know, context. But if, if I've been looking what I've been doing for 20 years, that's basically huge thing with algorithms and interesting algorithms. And I think that is uh, the combination of interesting algorithms and the service that you can actually build on that. <coughs> I might uh, sound a little bit naive when I say algorithm. I just use it as a working name right now. An algorithm, of course, you know, the definition of that is just kind of like one loop of you know, a piece of software, that's, you know, the definition of an algorithm. But in when I speak about algorithms, it is how, how we use them in combination with sort of the product and the service. So it's kind of like, for me, this is, you know, it's a physical thing that you attach a piece of software which makes it behave in a way it could never do without that software. So that's kind of the, yes. Yeah, I would say model instead. I would say, like, computer model. Yeah. <coughs> Data model. Yeah. Um, not only because algorithm is is such a restricted word, and and you 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 are not supposed to use it if if it's not if it doesn't fulfill these computer science things. But uh, I but, don't know. But for um, I've been thinking about similar things. I think about what what the what the computer system has to know about the world in order to function as good as it does. Mm -hmm. So in some cases you don't, it doesn't have to know anything. And, and uh, if it doesn't have to know more than, than separate light from, from non-light or something. And, and you can do amazing things with, mm -hmm. with Internet of Things uh, appliances that, that are only able to, to distinguish light from from no light, mm -hmm. but but I think that that one of the things that will happen in this field that you're talking about is that you will you will be forced to put so many characteristics of the real world into your computer model. Yeah, but I, I would say uh, the opposite, and because okay. if you take um, IBM Watson. Yes. It's a uh, well co cognitive computing at its best. It used to be. I mean, today they're making it a more or less a I wouldn't say consumer product, but something that you know, if we come up with a great project, we they will let us hook it up to IBM Watson, and then we have to actually have to teach it stuff. You know, you can't. It's not by programming. If you want it to read things, you have to connect it to the archive or where it can actually go through the text of what you want it to learn. So it's a like, completely different way of uh, of using it. When this guy, uh, Rossiano, 
can't remember his name now. Uh, well, anyway, he's in Zurich and he's teaching these quadcopters to juggle. He doesn't do that with sort of writing a program that actually makes them juggle. They he writes he, they construct kind of the neural network or the, the cognitive part that actually makes enable them to learn how to juggle or balance things. And that's he did uh, he I mean he can cut off rotors and it did not sort of it, there's not programming that makes it. It's actually this understanding it's all kind of you know point of balance and you know and how it can move and then it sort of experiments with its kind of its own kind of parameters to make itself fly off the ground so it's it's just i think in this space for me what makes it so fascinating is that most people i talk to they there's again you know this we said we had no language of wi-fi in these things this we don't even have models of and we don't even know how to kind of how to implement it etc so it's kind of I think we can do some pretty groundbreaking stuff if we can actually start talking about these things in a way, you know, makes us as designers or everyday, you know, people. And I think that's kind of the, a little bit the point of this. But uh, for, first, the difference between... Co I, I don't think there is such a thing as cognitive computing. I think it's a marketing term. No, yes, from of course. From IBM. It's not and, artificial intelligence either, but it's, I guess... I would say there is artificial intelligence. Um, yeah, we, we could debate that, and it's an interesting topic in this uh, also in this area because uh, I think it comes comes up when we start looking at more complex applications. But um, I think behind this is the same old algorithms that we have in ordinary computers or, or like a sorting algorithm. The one of the main differences with with what they call cognitive computing is that there is no natural endpoint. I I asked Christian Markenius, who's now now a professor of cognitive science and a specialist in, in artificial intelligence, and he said that well the, the main difference is that there should be an exit point in an algorithm. And what you do in a in a and modern now it's feedback loop instead. Yeah, and, yeah, and what you do in in a modern robot is <coughs> that you you just let it go. Mm -hmm. You you don't have an exit point. There is a stream mm -hmm. of of input and a stream of output, and you you never let it exit. Yeah. Um, although I, I uh, the the Watson people are marketing this cognitive term. Um, I think it's what well, it's called. I mean, it's also called the Internet of Things, but it even that term was <coughs> well, what Kevin Ashton mean when he coined the term, we kind of came up with it, was that there is a point where, well there was a point several years ago when we as humans could not kind of humanly input uh, the information into internet. That kind of, the machines kind of took over that space and today we will never catch up with them because they, the machines sort of produce so much internet and push it into the internet. And That's if what he. If, if you ask the the European Commission, what do they call the Internet of Things? I don't know, networked objects. No, they, they call it cyber physical systems, which <laughs> which is <laughs> which is a pity. It's, it's true. Says more about the it's European Union. Yeah, 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 that <laughs> is true. There's they're, this they're Internet of Things Council, I think you know. They, they call it cyber physical systems, and and there is now this Great. Horizon 2020, which is yeah. the now the, the new after is it this which comes after FP7. Yeah. Uh, uh, research financing. So in the next decade, if you want research money for Internet of Things, <laughs> that's what you're going to call it. Sorry. It, that call starts uh, <laughs> January 14. Actually, you are the third person to mention it. Just that in in just a very few days. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's yeah. uh, but so and also what I found out from uh, one uh, professor in Umeå was that the Horizons 2020 project, because you were the ones who are designers here, has uh, some, I haven't read it myself, but I will look into it, uh, has a way that it's sort of, they want projects to be sort of design driven, design led. So there's actually a space in it now, which never used to happen, because then you had to go to KTH or something like that, and all the design thing was just slashed, more or less. So, but now there's actually a proper, it should, should even be properly written, etc., for kind of design to either lead or be included in these projects. I, I can just briefly mention one other thing while we are at it. They they also did one more thing that they never did before. They call for experts with business experience. So they they want uh, actually Vinova retweeted the call from the European Commission, 
that they want experts and you can also register volunteer as an expert well it's it's you volunteer as an expert but I, as i understand it you you get an assignment uh, so you get paid for it when if you they want you as a uh, reviewer and they want people with both academic and people with business experience not you, as i understood it you don't have to be an academic first it, it's enough that you have extensive uh, experience with the with within the the business field that you're applying for so i think it's really interesting how they are opening up actually and, and to design too yeah. well anyway but let's um yeah let's take one more okay and then we can move on. yeah thanks for your presentation i really um i enjoyed it i liked the examples that you presented um i had um just uh, uh, just wanted to add something to the discussion um, and that was that um, you know the space that you were that is currently empty mm -hmm. um, we were living in such an amazing time with so many new technologies emerging that um, it's uh, very difficult even to focus on you know as a consumer mm -hmm. um, to to make a choice, um, and you know, I think that that's maybe uh, affects sometimes the ethics of you know, the way that people um, act in this marketplace. Um, <coughs> but also, I think that in this discussion, you know, there, there should be some thought about um, you know renewable resources. Um, you know that we can't uh, continue to. You know, that actually, you know, these computers um, require a lot of uh, expensive materials, and um, that's something that we haven't, it's one of these invisible factors, you know, sort of, that you, that you mentioned, I think, uh, is often overlooked in this top, mm. in this area. Mm. Just something to uh, add to your... Thanks. <laughs> no, but it's... Um, it's good. good one. And for you guys, I came just before, um, I just had to say it because um, you talked about this monster spray. There's a book where Neil, Ger uh, Neil whatever, Stevenson wrote uh, this Diamond Age where he had, they used hairspray to kill off all the internet of things, kind of the nanobots that were flying around mm. and spying on people. <laughs> There's a lot of hairspray in the future. <laughs> but anyway, I'll leave you with that. All right, thank you very much, Don.